Assalamu alaikum dear researchers and welcome to part 2 of our lecture number 4 structural model this is PLS SEM smart PLS 4 lecture series and we are going to discuss our remaining steps step number 4 and 5 for to analyze the structural model we will first of all discuss the sample size consideration then our step number 4 the predictive relevance using PLS predict algorithm we will also see how we can compare the predictive relevance using CVPAT and how we can compare different models using BIC criteria and using R square values. In the previous video to st uh, for the steps to analyze the structural model, we discussed how to assess the structural model for collinearity issues. That is step one. Step two, to assess the significance and relevance of structural model relationship. Step three, to assess the model explanatory power using R square and F square values. Now we are going to discuss how to assess the model predictive power. But before we discuss that, we have to look at the sample size. Obviously, the consideration of sample size starts before we execute, uh, execute a project or PLS project or before we collect the data. But since it is associated with PLS predict algorithm, so I have discussed it in this lecture and going to devote uh, a considerable portion of my lecture to discuss what is the sample size requirement. First of all, the sample size requirement of PLS SCM is considerably smaller than CP SCM because it is a more efficient algorithm it works with smaller sample size and with the overall complexity of model has no effect or little effect on the sample size criteria. So this is what gives PLS SCM edge over the CB SCM. However, we cannot say that our sample can be very small because if we have insufficient sample size, that can, this can lead to type 2 error because we fail to reject on our hypothesis. It is actually false in the actual population. So this is important that we need to have a substantial sample and even if we have a more heterogeneous uh, population then we need to have a large a larger sample size. So one of the important thing is that we can look at the statistical power because uh, often PLS SEM uh, yields a greater statistical power but we can also use the formula like G power calculator to determine the sample size or we can look at the population uh, characteristic and use some kind of tables to understand what type of sample we require. In addition to use of power tables or power analysis programs like G power, another often cited uh, formula to calculate the sample size is the 10 times rule. 10 times rule means that we can count the number of arrows that are going into the most complex regression in our model and just multiply it by 10. So for instance, in our uh, model that we were discussing, our DV, for endogenous variable, this this has the most number of arrows coming towards it. So these are three. So just multiply it by ten. So we can say that thirty is the minimum sample size requirement. But often this this uh, rule is being criticized because it does not consider the statistical power uh, of the model. And in the case of uh, some complex uh, regressions like formative measurement model in which the arrows are coming towards uh, the DV as well. For instance, if I inverted like this. Now we have eight arrows coming towards our DV. So the minimum sample would change to 80. So often this is cited uh, for the sample size, but not recommended. They recommend more the G power formula and another one, the inverse square root method. So what happens in inverse square root method is that it considers a probability that the ratio of the path coefficient and its standard error will be greater than the critical value of a test statistic for a specific significance level. What significance level as we will see in a while that we need to choose that significance level and then we will have an idea of what is the minimum sample size we require to get uh, the critical value of the test statistic. This is more conservative and lenient approach as it will uh, render uh, the larger sample size as compared to the minimum sample size requirement. But it is a very retrospective approach because how will we decide what is our significance value, minimum significance value required for a minimum uh, path coefficient required for a specific significance value if we do not have the data. So what we can do is either we can use the results of the pilot study as a criteria or we can consult the similar studies in uh, our literature and decide that uh, in what value of path coefficient we are getting the significance, uh, significant result and we can use the following table to decide what is the minimum sample we should have for our own uh, data set. For example, if we are getting 
for the path coefficient between 0 0.05.1, we need at least 451 if we are we set our significance level at 0.1 or 10 percent. 619 if at 5 percent and 1004 at 1 percent. But this uh, path coefficient value is very less. Sometimes what happens is that between 0.1 and 0.2, if we expect our results to be significant at 1% and 251, at 5% and 155, and at 10% or 0.1 is 113. So I think most of the time, because we can also see in the literature that the minimum path coefficient should be uh, greater than 0.1. So th this 0.11 and 0.2 is a very good criteria that we can select around about 155 if we expect our significance value to be 5% and 251 if we expect to be 1% at 1% our results to be significant. And what we are doing is we are assuming the power level of 80%. As you can see that we have at 5% uh, this is the path coefficient between fear of terrorism and psychological distress 0 0.205 and it is significant and then between negative effect and psychological distress is 0.598 which is high path coefficient it is also significant and this 0 0.026 is not significant so with our sample size of 121 we can expect that between 0.21 and 0.3 at 1% we are getting these significant results uh, because all of these are greater than 0 0.05 that is 1% significant so our sample size with the criteria between 0.21 and 0.3 is actually sufficient for this particular uh, data set. The sample size consideration is important in our step 4 which is to assess the model's predictive power or out of sample predictive power which relates to generalization of the results. Previously the Q-square statistics was used to uh, judge this predictive power. The Q-square value greater than 0 tell us that the model has enough predictive power. But recently a better procedure that is PLS predict procedure is recommended to check the model's predictive power. The Q-square predict is also used as the naive benchmark to start with that if it is greater than zero, then uh, the model does have some kind of a predictive uh, abilities. But the PLS procedure is it is a more accurate procedure and it has three considerations. That is the number of folds, uh, how many same uh, partitions we break down over uh, sample and that is why it is very important for us to know that uh, what is the sample size and how in how many different samples can be break down over uh, data because each fold should have the uh, should fulfill the minimum requirement of the data then the number of repetition for each time PLS product procedure is run and uh, the overall results are compiled and these results are then reflected in the prediction statistics so two prediction statistics are used MAE or mean absolute error and RMSC, that is root mean square error. In most of the time, the root mean square error is the preferred one until the prediction error is very highly unsymmetric. If these two statistics have a smaller values, which indicates a high predictive power. So what is done is that two times these are calculated first for the linear regression benchmark model and then the for PLS SCM benchmark model. And the comparison is made as such that for both of these, if all PLS SCM values are less than the linear regression values, LM values, then the model has a high predictive power. If for most of those indicators have uh, less PLS SCM values as compared to LM values, then the model has a medium predictive power. If for less number, like uh, for out of total 10 indicators, 4 or 3 has uh, lower PLS SCM values for both of these statistics then the model has a low predictive power and for none then the model lacks predictive power. So let's see how it is done in PLS SCM. We go to calculate and PLS predict then how many number or how many uh, different uh, sets we want to break down our data into. Since the model is uh, of my data is 120 around 120 and if I use the 10 times rule then it seems that 30 is the minimum required sample size so I have broken down into 4. The number of repetition is important, 10 is a recommended one, you can also keep it 1 but if you do it 10 your accuracy will increase. So let's start our calculations and we go to these MV prediction summaries. Here we can see that this is the indicators or the remaining indicators of our dependent variable. 
because some of the indicators we have already removed to improve the measurement model accuracy. But as we can see that if we consider RMSC still according to the benchmark, the model has a low predictive power because majority of these PLS, SEM, RMSC are and it is shown by red here because uh, are higher in fact and only one is lower. So if one is lower which means the model has very low predictive power. Even if we compare MAE values, we can see that uh, only two, which is again less than the total number because total is five. So again, the model has low predictive power. Our naive benchmark used to predict in all cases is greater than zero, which means the model does have some kind of predictive power, but it is very low. Now let's see the error histogram that which of the statistics should be compared. So as you can see, the error distribution is quite unsymmetrical over here because we have many peaks for first indicator, set second indicator as well, third indicator, fourth is a bit symmetrical and this one is also a bit symmetrical but overall uh, we can go to MAE values because uh, we can see quite a bit unsymmetric in our results. We can choose MAE and compare. So the conclusion is that the model that we have just run has low predict predictive power. So what to do if our uh, model has a very low predictive power and no predictive power at all and even in this few cases our Q-square value is less than zero. So how to treat this predictive power issues? We need to check two things. First of all, we may have issue with our data or we may have issue with our measurement model. First of all, if we look at the data, we may see that if there is a large variance in our indicators, so all those values which are very away from the mean would yield a low predictive power. Are we using a single item by yes? Because often in the case, if we have single item by yes, we may have a very low predictive power because the only item we are available. Do we have a U-shaped distribution that can be a problematic? Uh, so what we can do is we can consider removing the outliers from our data, consider transforming the problematic indicator. Maybe we consider using a logarithm uh, to normalize over indicators that can be one of the uh, treatment if we really want to increase the predictive power of our model. Secondly, we can see the issue with our uh, measurement model. For instance, uh, if we have a low indicator loading to such extent that uh, we are fulfilling the AVE values criteria and our liabilities are okay, but still our indicator loadings are low, that can also be a problem. We can check the indicators uh, descriptives from our data and our DB that we were looking the results for uh, psychological distress. Here we can find the standard deviations and uh, I don't find two extreme values in standard deviation. That, that does not seem to be a problem at all. Secondly, if we, we see the results for the outer loadings from over here, so we see very good loadings is all greater than 0.7, which does not indicate that this is again the problem. So overall, it seems that our model's predictive power is quite low. Probably the reason is that our sample was collected from very uh, diverse group of foreigners, foreign students uh, residing in Pakistan and the sample size was very low. So we can say because of this heterogeneity, our predictive power is somewhat on the lower side. Another criteria that has been recently developed as an alternative to PLS predict is cross-validative predictive ability test that is CVPAT. Now it applies an out of sample prediction approach to calculate the model's prediction error which determines the average loss value. These average loss values are calculated for the PLS and then they are compared with the average loss value of prediction using indicator average as a naive benchmark and as the average loss value of a linear model forecast as a more conservative benchmark. So what is the criteria that PLS SM, SEM averages should be significantly lower than the indicator averages and then LM forecast that actually gives us a more better picture, a better picture that our model has a predictive ability. So let's see in PLS. So on the left hand side, you can see we have this CPPAT. First, we check the indicator averages and we see that this is negative and it is significant which means that PLS SEM uh, results are actually lower than the indicator averages which means that the knife or the basic criteria is fulfilled. Our model does have some kind of predictive 
ability. Now, if we check it compared with the linear model, we see that this is not significant. And as we have seen in our previous result for PLS predict that our model does have a very low predictive ability that is actually verified by CVPAT criteria as well. As we can see that for the more conservative comparison with the linear model, the criteria is not fulfilled. Although our model does have some predictive ability because the comparison indicator averages is, is, is lower than and it is significant. Now comes the discussion of our last step or the optional step to analyze the structural model. As you can see that it is in uh, those dashed lines because it is the optional uh, to compare the models. In essence, we have actually finished our steps to analyze the structural model. And unlike CPSEM, the concept of model fit or the overall model fit in PLS SEM is not as applicable because we have already assessed the model's explanatory power using R square and model's predictive power. And the main purpose was to assess the significance and relevance of the structural model relationship. That is what PLS SEM is the main focus is. But what we can also do, if applicable, we can compare the different models and which we can see that which of these models are likely to have a better results. I go to this PLS SCM. Now this is one of the model here that we have already discussed a lot. I can do is I can remove one of these insignificant path and again check the results. So how we can check the result? One of the criteria that I'm going to discuss right now and it is given in PLS SEM is the model selection criteria, the BIC values. Now these BIC are basically one way to judge uh, if our model has a better fit. We can also compare R square values for different models. So what we can do is that we can copy these results into Excel. And as you can see that I have copied the result. This is our first model. Then I have removed uh, one of the indicator which was not significant. This is our second model and this is the third model in which I have introduced a mediator and we're going to discuss the mediator in our later lectures and we can see the results of BIC over here. This is minus 66. This is minus 71. This is minus 65. So as we can clearly see this BIC, the lower the value of BIC, the better is the result. Similarly, for model 2, you can also see that the R square values uh, is higher as compared to model 1 and model 3. So we can say that our model 2 is a better fit than our model 1 and model 3. This is all about the structural model for now and for the later discussion upon mediation, moderation and advanced topics, follow my further lecture on PLS-SCM.